Okay, what I'm going to be talking about today, first, since it's been a while since I've seen a lot of you, I figured I'd consider my microphone. Bring up to speak about what I've been doing. Um, and then after that, some playful what of things that, um, and the reason why I kind of did this is, well, I don't have an experiment to talk about. I don't have a, a theory to talk about, and I haven't been able to do much, so that's about all I could do. The other thing, too, is that in having prior discussions with other people about um, other things I've talked about, when I've done these, they say, oh, I really like to see that. You should do it more. So someone thought it would be interesting to see. Um, and so hopefully it will be interesting here. Okay, the first thing I've been redoing is rebooting my Tau Zero Foundation. Uh, for those who don't know me, I uh, led NASA's Breakthrough Propulsion Physics Project, um, which looked at a lot of this in very uh, general ways and even uh, sponsored some research. And um, when NASA quit looking that far out, I took an early retirement to try and continue the work of the nonprofit. And with difficulties. Um, so what I did is realizing I suck at running an organization, I brought in other help. I'm not going to go through listing all who these people are, but the basic thing is um, getting help to do other things and trying to expand stuff. And then there's the proverbial mission and vision statements. Um, essentially, trying to push the technology and sciences forward to eventually enable human interstellar flight, which right now is seemingly impossible. Um, but instead of gravitating on just one project, the, the, the tactic is, is to, from all the things that we have today, what can be done today to chip away at progress? And then um, near-term things about where are like the next steps that you would take, uh, the propulsion physics one, and then also, um, oh, Okay, hopefully I did the right. I noticed I, that was a typo I fixed, but okay, well, if these aren't the updated charts, oops. Um, but I'm trying to also create educational materials and things like that to teach people how to do it. Oh, and by the way, one of the things about um, that I ran into on these propulsion physics projects, when I was doing this for NASA, about 80% of my labor time was on how to convey these edgy topics in a way where you're still doing credible stuff. That trying to, the balance of asking the visionary questions, but anchored with um, reliable reasoning and, and stuff, which when that doesn't happen, it, it taints the topic. Um, the kind of things that we're doing so far is well, spreading the news, if, if you, don't already know about the Centauri Dreams uh, website. There's five articles a week based on peer-reviewed journal articles about things that are related to interstellar flight. Um, some new things with the STEM things that are for a PBS program, our website. And something I started recently is an interstellar short course, which I gave at Dresden. I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, we have a NASA grant um, to do, and I'll say more about what that is. And uh, so far, uh, the propulsion physics stuff, there was the book that we did in 2009, uh, an overview of the topic of saying, these are the ideal goals, this is the physics as we know it, what are the next step questions? Um, and collaborating with Martin Timar on his space drive project, and then also, um, the other thing too is that the things we do isn't just Tau Zero people. It's like the broader organization. Who are the people out there that are doing things um, with reliable results that we can uh, collaborate with and try and get the message out? Um, and oh, uh, hopefully, if this is the right set of charts, I'll say something more about that. Um, and so there's also some uh, experiments on trying to demonstrate negative energy that Eric Davis and George Hathaway are working on. Um, okay, yep, yeah, this is the one. Um, and so, Having gotten to a rough start, I'm at the point now of trying to rebuild my network, not only of subject matter experts, of other affiliate organizations who are the ones that um, are doing the more uh, reliable work and trying to figure out how to uh, spread the news. Um, we're also trying to get into more near-term technology work. Um, there's some uh, grant proposals out on some uh, antimatter um, storage techniques and things like that, as well as uh, some grant proposals in about uh, STEM and STEAM things. Okay, about the grant, and also these are fairly compressed things. It's a three-year grant, and hopefully there will be three years of funding, as opposed to if you've ever worked for NASA, there's no guarantee. It's a study about interstellar flight in general. I was asked to explicitly include the propulsion physics uh, aspects, and it's basically to create a process um, for comparing 
all the different ideas for doing interstellar missions, the vehicle concepts, to ask not which mission and vehicle is the right one, but of all of that stuff, are there common critical research questions that could be worked on now that would have a broader impact, and how to figure that out. And uh, the other difference with that is including the span of motivations, because when you look at why you're doing some of the things, it greatly affects uh, what you choose to do. One critical example, if the motivation is the survival of humanity, then you start looking more towards sustainable habitats and world ships as opposed to propulsion. Um, and if your motivation is to be the first to do something, that's different than if you want to uh, do other aspects. So to putting those in explicitly. Um, the challenge of uh, with these very different methods, how do you uh, measure them on common grounds, um, which basically we're reducing it to energy, power, mass, and time, uh, which all that. Also including infrastructure development as part of the process of, of doing these. And we're, when you look at interstellar missions, the time frame we're talking about is way beyond predictability, which is what this next one. Um, and for reference here, I have some historic things. It took 23 years to go from the rocket equation to the first rocket, liquid rocket, which I thought was pretty impressive. Uh, 60 years to go from the beginning of nuclear science to having a nuclear power plant on the grid. 70 years from a light bulb to the first computer. And 100 years to go from the steam era version of launching a, um, a spaceship to the moon using a giant cannon versus the first Apollo. And the reason why I do that one is because in a sense, if we're talking about these sort of time scales and you were to go back in the steam era and ask people how is the best way to go to the moon, you're probably gonna hear arguments about which thermal cycle is best as opposed to not having forward seen nuclear or the chemical rockets. So on these sort of time scales, a lot of things can change, which is why also when you include the propulsion physics that you know, if 50 years of physics advancements takes to get this, well, we're still in kind of a competitive range. Uh, the other one to call out explicitly here, and it didn't survive the final language of the uh, NASA appropriations, but there was something in there about looking into if you were going to launch on the centennial of uh, Apollo, um, 2069, uh, a 10% light speed mission to Alpha Centauri. Well, if you include the uh, transit time and the data time, you're, okay, we're spanning a century. And then even the Starshot one, um, even though they're hoping to d launch sooner and 20% light speed, when you also look at, they're considering 20 years it will take to transmit the data back. So we're still talking, even if they're going fast, the time to get the data is still pretty long. So how to, over those long time scales, try and get smart questions for tomorrow's research portfolio, that's kind of the challenge of the grant. Uh, just a, a side question here. Heidi, what was on, on the proposal? What did you guys come in at? 30 years to get there? 20 years to get there, five years to get there. The, the way I'm handling propulsion physics in general is just um, energy conversion, stored energy into kinetic energy so I can cover them and then with some efficiency factor. But as these develop more and someone in here was doing a mission study on that, I'll get those. So the, the generic approach is stored energy into kinetic energy. Um, so the basic steps is to ask the right questions. What are the challenges? What are the prospects that we have? Um, then to try and get accurate answers in all those and actually put it on this online database and then comparing the algorithms and make recommendations. And just as a, a short of how to do that, there's the choice-driven inputs. And the idea is to create these things called um, topology maps uh, where you're not looking, you're looking to see as you change your various choices uh, which technology options or mission options uh, seem to have a greater impact um, or which questions seem to have a, a greater impact. So it's going through the process to do that of the things that you can vary by choice, uh, the things that we have to force by nature, um, and then what are the technology options and, and come up with that and go through. There's a, a longer version of this that goes in that. But then after, um, oh, I already mentioned this, as far as comparing the uh, very different approaches um, and how to compare them, because comparing ISP to beamed energy is difficult, but when you reduce it down to energy, power, mass, and time, it becomes easier. Um, another comparative baseline is that assuming any given launch year, we're forcing the same payload characteristics, mass, power, or whatever, 
um, and also some of the same design parameters, what your specific masses are for things to be uh, the same in that, yeah. Deeds, does your analysis take into account the time it takes to construct these vehicles on orbit? Yeah, well, th that, yeah, and what we're doing there, and what's hard to get estimates, because when you're talking about the infrastructure development, the mining and all that, all of those are very vague in their projection. Mm -hmm. So the tool there is to assume it as a, um, an energy thing. How much energy does it take to mine the materials, joules per kilogram, to transport them to wherever you're building it, um, and whatever base. So when you have, you know, your master your vehicle, how many joules is going to come back with there, and then what is the projections of what energy we will have available as the future goes. So it's kind of reducing it into that. Which, okay. granted, even though those are very crude approximations, <laughs> if all of the comparisons are done by the same crude approximations, it might help see those relative differences. And it's not so much about getting absolute answers, it's trying to see relatively, okay, what has a bigger impact here? So that's kind of the, the strategy on uh, doing that. Um, okay, and then the other one is that when you have a complex system, uh, to focus more on what is the lowest TRL item in that and how long it would it take to advance it. Because if all the other stuff's ready, that's not driving your, your schedule. So that's kind of the, the rough strategy. And in the final year, uh, the idea is, is to, yeah. with all that, question, oh, I'm sorry. The question is, what is TRL? Oh, technology readiness levels. Uh, it's a scale that is used by NASA and a lot of the aerospace of comparing the readiness of something. Technology readiness level one is when the basic principles have been um, observed. Um, and technology we had at level six, I think, is something that's been tested at the system level. And nine is that it's actually used in space. Um, and it's a way of comparing the relative maturity. And then, of course, so you have timelines it, it takes to go through that. And that is a whole expansive discussion onto itself. Um, and those things are easily findable on Google searches, technology readiness levels, and you can find all the stuff there. Um, so the idea is, is that, okay, what are the answers that we don't have? What research would you do? And what I would like to do, and this was a strategy I tried to do with the propulsion physics project, only we only had one cycle, is to have um, cycles of solicitations of short-term research, one to three years, um, just chipping away at some of those questions, and then cycle through that as you learn things. And hopefully as the years go on and you start to see things that are more promising or dead ends, you adjust your course. So the, trying to define the whole process for that. Okay, the interstellar short course. Um, I was invited to Dresden over the summer to give a condensed version of essentially the propulsion physics book in the context of interstellar. So there's a short bit about why interstellar is hard, what are the ideas, and when I say three eras of prospect, the eras are precursors, meaning what we can launch from Earth with foreseeable technology, the era of infrastructure, which is you have to build these things in space because they're huge, and then the unforeseeable future of propulsion physics, um, and comparing those separately. Um, and then about two-thirds of the rest of the presentation is largely reviewing the propulsion physics things, the space drives and, and things like that. And a week after next, I'm also doing it at Purdue. Now, when I did it at Dresden, it was uh, spread over 10-ish weeks or something like that. At Purdue, it's one week, two hours a day, day after day. So, yeah, I'm, I, I haven't done it like that. It'll be interesting to see how well that goes over. So that's also what I've been uh, up to. Who's your contact? Um, she. Uh, I, I can get that too. The first name that popped in my mind, even though I forget his first name, okay. I think it's S H I H. Okay. Okay. Now to these things, and the reason why I'm starting off with the science fiction inspirations is, um, well, that's kind of how I got into this, and historically. Um, they found all the rocketry pioneers were inspired by the science fiction of their days. So I just thought I'd throw this montage. And I'm curious, how many people in the audience recognize all of these? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, those, um, and some of these I liked. Uh, I actually got a kick out of this one. That was uh, the Explorers. Yeah, right. Yeah. Kids and they found the one right. that had a green. Yeah, um, but they had a spherical 
regime that then had the propulsion fix. It was a kind of a cool idea. Um, but the reason why this one is highlighted is because when I was an impressionable child, that's the one that I saw. And um, so what I did is when I was somewhere between 10 and 14 years old, I knew we were in a new house and I knew it was before puberty kicked in and I couldn't concentrate anymore. Um, <laughs> I used to imagine that uh, shuttle from the, um, the Enterprise hovering over my driveway and ask, well, what would happen if I threw rocks at it and poked it with a stick? What happened to the trajectory of the rocks? This is kind of the process I used. And so if, um, if you throw the rocks there and they don't vary in their trajectory, then that means the vehicle somehow isn't affected by gravity, which means that, okay, if it doesn't have any gravitational mass, does that mean that it doesn't have any inertial mass? So if you poked it with a stick, would it just go flying off very quickly? Um, next one is, well, what if you threw the rocks and then while they're going there, they just go straight? Like, in that case, is the vehicle somehow modifying the gravitation of the space rather than the vehicle? And then uh, another one that, well, what if you had an inverted gravitational field, in which case objects would probably, and dirt and stuff, would collect on that divot on the top. And then another variation is, what if it's pushing on surrounding uh, matter, and the rocks would do that. So playing those sort of mental games uh, got me into pondering these things. And so some of the questions that came to mind is realizing, okay, obviously you have the Earth, gravity, pulling down on this thing, but you also have the gravitational pull of all the other objects in the universe. And granted, they're farther away, so it's a piddly force, but there's a lot of them. And, but since they're evenly distributed, there wouldn't be any net force. So um, even though I didn't know about Mach's principle at the time, kind of realizing, well, this is one way of starting to think about things. Um, the other thing I was wondering is, well, how much energy would it really take or power to levitate something? You know, put, I mean, what sort of scale we're talking about. So one way of doing it, and, and these are just kind of crude estimates to get a scale on the problem, is that if you could zero out the gravitational potential energy of the vehicle, which is analogous to taking it from here to infinity, and what does that come down to? And it ends up being uh, 63 megajoules per kilogram, or 18 kilowatt hours if you like that. And, um, and at $2, uh, or at 12 cents per kilowatt hour, if you wanted to levitate something the size of a car, it would be about $3,000. And if you have the power of roughly a household, in other words, if you're writing science fiction about some crazy person doing something in their garage, it will probably take them about two years to charge up whatever this effect is. So anyway, I just thought that was a fun way of looking at it. And then the helicopter analogy. Um, and running through the math there, and I noticed that the uh, the proportionalities on these, of it doesn't go directly with the mass or mass squared, but three halves. Um, and it, it turns out to be for one kilogram and a one square meter of rotor space is about 20 watts, which, you know, these things aren't really all that much energy and power if you could do them with no loss of efficiency. And then some of these charts, some of you have seen before about, okay, Playing with these in terms of analogy, um, the buoyancy, uh, which, okay, I'll expand on these later, or reaction force or ground effects, and then taking that to the next level of detail. And here's where it gets back to the other ones about if the vehicle could zero out its own gravitational effects, that would be one way, um, or zero out the gravitational effects in the surrounding space, or create an opposing field, or to push on the surrounding air, or push on space itself, um, or somehow shield gravity, or repulsing on the ground. And then getting into secondary questions like, okay, if you eliminate the gravitational mass of the vehicle, does it also eliminate the inertia? And what would be the consequences? Um, with these, well, how far do those effects go? The objects collecting on top. Um, how far does it go? And this is the one where it starts to key into uh, Mach's principle and things like that. What's the reaction mass if it's pushing on space? Um, and then certainly questions about shielded gravity and if you were doing ground repulse, what if the ground is no longer rigid if it was like water? N now, these sort of questions and pondering is what I would do to kind of get me started thinking about things. And so I'm talking more about that kind of informal playful process rather than uh, rigorous stuff. And so to make an analogy with something else, how many are familiar with the thing where you have a, um, 
If you have an object floating in clean water and you put a little bit of detergent behind it that it zooms across, okay, what happens is, is that as soon as you drop the detergent in there, um, that changes the surface tension of the water and moves the craft. Now, the craft had no propulsion on it. You altered the surrounding space. And so can you make an analogy to that? Um, is space-time the reaction mass in this? And uh, can you make any local and asymmetric changes of any of those? Inertial frames, Newton's constant, gravitational scalar potential, um, Planck, speed of light, zero point energy, or what? You know, trying to, okay, what all do we have to work with that we might be able to do that? And then for my own um, bias, I like to think in terms of fields um, and scalar potential. And then also thinking of inertia in the same sort of way. Um, but what about also the quantum vacuum? And then, you know, all the things that there might be fields of. Um, now granted, there are all sorts of different ways of looking at this. This is the one when I play with my own imagination, that was the easiest way to do, is about with any of those, how would you create an asymmetric field? And another detail here is that if magically your vehicle could momentarily alter the properties of space around it, that's one step. And then how space pushes on the vehicle is a second step, um, as opposed to, uh, it all being mixed together and there's longer versions of some of the consequences of this actually one of the chapters in uh, the book um, about these things but for the playful way of looking at it and then okay the, the chapter in the book so one of the ways to ask about that from given equations if you could alter any of those things um, you know one at a time what effect it might have, like the negative mass propulsion, if you could change the sign of um, the mass, or if you could separate the properties of mass that create gravitational fields, react to gravitational uh, fields, and inertia. Which, by the one, what's nice about that one is that when you run through the math and ask, well, if you could do that, how much would accelerate? It's that if the inertial gravitational active and passive mass have all the same magnitude, nothing happens. They would have to actually have different magnitudes. So by playing with these things, you get to a point where you can get more detailed questions and um, other things. So that was the kind of stuff I had done before. And the idea of um, pushing against space-time or a Machian thing, uh, well, here we go. So you turn on your engines, your spacecraft one goes one way, and the rest of the universe goes the other. Now, okay, so what was the, the inertial frame that the whole universe was? Well, anyway, getting in this and realize, oh, this whole thing about conservation of momentum and what is an inertial frame uh, led me to wonder, okay, what would you do? So, and going bias, um, I think in terms of fields and vectors and things like that, and then also seeing inertial frames describable as gravitational potential, uh, scalar potential, which I know is not exact, but for the sake of beginning to play with these things, um, that's what I'm gonna do. What I had hoped to do is to derive some equations starting from scratch about, well, how do masses and charges affect the properties of an inertial frame, and then how do the properties of the inertial frame affect motion of things in there, and also entertaining different um, propagation speeds for the inertial frame effects and light to see if that ended up with anything. And hoping that all that would result to where there might be some wave phenomenon, and if there's wave phenomenon, how you might uh, uh, predict and measure that, and if you could measure that, then can you create waves, and in those um, gradients there, could you get propulsion effects? So Frank, a fairly loose thinking. So that's what I was hoping to do. I didn't get very far into it. Um, what waves, what's waving? Okay, uh, a illustrated, uh, the best example I can think of, imagine if there were some sort of uh, scalar wave, kind of like analogous to sound of inertial frame properties. If you suddenly changed uh, the mass of the thing, how long would it take for that to propagate out? Are there any wave phenomena like that? And if they do exist, would we have been able to notice them so far? I mean, because um, if they would be very long wavelength or very fast, we wouldn't really see anything. Um, so it's like, I'd be curious to see 
if I could get to that point, and then what would be, and then also play games about, okay, should I consider transverse waves, longitudinal waves, dispersive medium, uh, play games to see what it is. Um, and the idea here, too, is um, not to come up with the basic of how inertial frame might really be, but ask what, for the purposes of propulsion, what would be the convenient inertial frame if it acted like that? Describe that and then see, does that match reality at all? Um, so trying to derive these things in the biased point of view of what would be a useful sort of phenomenon um, that you could use for propulsion and then see whether or not that comes back. Um, I did publish a paper on that, but I didn't get very far, mostly to illustrate the process. Um, no hypotheses, only barely got into uh, doing the thought experiments, but I'm going to run through uh, those now. Okay, like I said, I'm looking for a space drive friendly version of an inertial frame. And if, luckily, if, if it could do that and it matches how nature really is, great. But if it doesn't match, okay, oh well. Um, so I'm starting with a, a literal interpretation of, of mocking thing, that it's created by the surrounding matter. So you have something to push against, kind of like that big circle. Um, that also then implies an absolute reference frame, which then shifts me to Euclidean treatments. And then since using Euclidean treatments, that um, means I use the optical mechanical analogy for describing how light propagates in that. And I think I have a chart on what that is. If I go to the next one, it isn't, I'll explain on that. And the other thing I'm doing differently is in the Mach's principle, it's inertia here because of matter everywhere out. I'm separating that to two steps. I'm saying inertial frame here because of the surrounding matter. And then as a second question, how does an inertial frame, and this implies that it could have some variation, affects the objects in that frame. And hopefully by splitting those as two separate things might discover things that um, would normally be overlooked. Oh, okay, I did include it. For those who aren't familiar, the normal general relativity of Riemannian geometry, um, to use in simple terms, distance, uh, how fast you're going and how long you do it. In that context, your reference constant is the speed of light, and so in the presence of a gravitating body, space, and time get warped. In the variable refractive index, where the index of refraction is higher near gravitating body, and that makes light bend, is essentially your reference constant is space, and so your speed of light and how you measure time measure. And supposedly, even though I've not run these um, themselves. The math for both of those are interchangeable. I've never, I mean, I've, I have papers that state that. I've never actually tried to verify that myself. Um, so, how would you create such a frame? I, mean, I would do it. And so I need some way to describe what are the properties of the frame and how does it come from, from other contributing sources. And the one that when talking about this with other people that I realize is one of the weird parts is the idea of having more than one inertial frame of different strengths or intensities or magnitudes of what that would mean. And that's kind of a, we don't normally think about that. And that's where some of these thought experiments are trying to illuminate what that might be. And the reason why I even asked that question, getting back to the wave part, if there can be increases and decreases, and if you can take advantage of that later. And then also, if you do that, I'm gonna need a description of how the frame affects inertia, the motion of matter, and also um, light. Okay, so starting with an empty space that has absolutely no inertial properties at all, meaning that if you stuck a test mass in there, you have, um, it essentially has no inertia or you have no way of measuring it, which is, Already a hard thing to imagine. Okay, so let's stick a hypothetical inertial frame into this void. And I use the um, recticule, or you can also I end up thinking in terms of spherical shells on this. And you put a test mass inside. Now, if indeed that's the only thing causing an inertial frame to exist, and you move that around, the test particle should stay coincident with it. Or that's an assertion. Uh, on this, no matter if you rotate it around, uh, which 
the analogous case would be if you had something like that and it was standing still and you arbitrarily moved a null reference frame, it shouldn't have any effect on that. So that's kind of an ingoing, okay, premise, let's check that out. And so already you have some options of different ways of doing that. Um, do we use multi-dimensional space? So I'm starting with just the normal 3D space and time. Um, and then, okay, what is giving rise to these inertial frame effects? Is it mass, um, energy, charge, or some other combination of the things or not? I'm not sure. I'm leaving open the possibilities of revisiting things, but for starting point, okay, assume mass in the same way. And also a provisional representation for what is the inertial frame strength inside one of these spherical shells. This, I'm just using the same sort of um, analogies to scalar potential and where this is some scaling factor that would have to do with uh, whatever your units are and the properties of space and the four pi is the spherical part. Um, whatever mass is contributing to the frame and the radius of that sphere. It's trying to get some at least foot in the door of how you might mathematically start to compare these things. So as far as comparing the things is that what if you had more than one inertial frame? And you're asking, if you move them relative to each other, what would happen to the test particle? Now, if only the yellow frame existed, the particle should stay with that. And if only the blue frame existed, the particle would stay there. But if both of them are contributing proportionally, the particle would be somewhere in between, which then this gets you to a way where you can start um, mathematically describing the summation of different inertial frame effects. Um, and then you get into more than one options of how you might do that. Uh, right now I'm assuming that whatever property it is that leads to inertial frames follows the same inverse square law. Um, again, that's a bias thinking in terms of gravitational scalar potential. Um, or is it waves or is it some other combination? And then also, what is it about space that allows these things to be um, carry over uh, space? Is it uh, gravitational scale potential, or is it the quantum vacuum, or something else? Um, trying to leave the options open. And then if you're adding these, those two frames on top, is it a linear superposition? Or, uh, and also scalar potential, or some other ve vector properties, or whatever, or is it nonlinear? And the underlying ones are kind of like my starting point where I'd be curious to see where these leads. Actually, you can see how these are kind of adding up to a whole bunch of permutations of different ways. And you try it, okay, try with that one, that one, that one, and see where it leads. So it was starting to get messy and why I didn't get all that far. Okay, and then also it comes down with uh, rotation. If you had only the one frame, and it rotated, the objects inside should track right with that. If you have two frames there and the frames are rotated relative to each other, then the object's rotation matches, now, or is somewhere in between. Um, and an another mental analogy to this is uh, frame dragging. Um, if you have a rotating mass, if, for example, the inertial frame contribution of the universe was very weak, you'd have more frame dragging. If, you would, if it was very strong, you'd have less, kind of thinking in <laughs> those torque, ways. Torque converter. Hmm? It's a torque converter. Yeah, <laughs> okay, a torque converter. Anyway, um, I threw this in here because in the case of looking for, inter, uh, you know, what are the natural phenomena that are really there, and when you see something that's like, gosh, that's odd, I didn't know that. Um, this was a paper that seemed to indicate that there's a correlation between the angular momentum of objects and their mass. I'd never seen this before. I have no idea how well this tracks with all the data, but if you're interested to go check that out, that was one that was like, geez, that's weird. I wonder if that's some clue as to figuring these things out. So throw that one out there. Um, okay, so now if you have an inertial frame of two different strengths, what effect does that have on um, the motion of objects in here? And just from the sake of, if you apply the same force or you apply the same momentum or you supply the same energy, um, would it move slower in the higher frame than in the lesser frame? And again, options come in with here. What 
is this variable inertial frame affecting? Is it, um, and I just stuck in there a hypothetical coefficient, uh, is it affecting the mass? In which case then you also have to talk about some bare mass on top of which the inertial frame affects. Or is it affecting uh, the apparent rate of time? You could go either ways on that. Um, I would find it simpler to do the mass because you notice on the mass on there, um, they're all the same uh, order. If you're talking about time, well you have uh, uh, meter per second in one and meter per second squared in other words. So as far as a, a first four way into this, I would try and do that. And then running across other kind of things. Have any of you ever noticed that, uh, now this is not in proper units, so I show in proper units too, that if you just do um, that expansion, you have momentum or inertia, momentum, kinetic energy in higher order terms. I just thought that was, ran across something like that and I never seen it before. I have no idea whether or not this is anything useful or not. I just found it of a interesting curiosity to share. Um, okay, now about affecting light speed. Um, with the optical mechanical analogy, if you're in uh, closer to a gravitating body, light speed moves slow. So the same sort of analogy here is that light speed would be slower in a stronger inertial frame than not. And if any of you have never seen this example, um, this is a laser light bending in a refraction gradient by sugar water, that the water is denser at the bottom than it is at the top, and that's what causes it. So it's an analogy to that kind of thing. Now, adding more complications. Um, is there a delay between the time, if you could magically move the source of inertial frame by the time it reaches a test mass, or is there some finite delay? Um, and how would you throw that into the mix? And so you have some options there too. Do you assume that that propagation speed is the same as light speed or higher or lower? And I would like to think if I ever get to the point where I start putting these more into mathematics, I would not want to impose a priori that they're the same velocity. I would like to have those different velocities in there and hope as the derivations progress, you find a case where that they have to be the same or not. Um, and Oh, I don't remember the, uh, I don't know if it was Jeff Emenko or someone else when trying to do um, analogies with retarded potentials of electromagnetism and gravitation, they assumed right off the bat that they were the same propagation velocity and I thought, I, I mean that's a fair assumption but I'd really be curious to see what would happen if you assumed they were different and then ran the rest of the equations to see what would happen there. Um, Again, yeah. the recent detection of gravity waves from neutron stars indicates they're the same. Right? Well, um, okay, here's, for those quadrupole type waves, obviously they're the same, or I'm assuming that they have some way of correlating the... Well, they saw, they saw optical and gravitational signatures in the same place. Okay, okay. Um, I'm not sure, I, I'm open to more generally that, is that the only wave phenomenon that can have with space-time, or could there be something else you could that have, might have you different could have a monopole from a scalar field that is massless, and therefore uh, if the coupling constant of the scalar tensor field is uh, small, as we have measured from the solar system, which is about uh, omega-40,000, it, the energy would be much smaller and it would not have been detected by the gravitational wave uh, mm -hmm. experiment. Therefore, so your, your opening would be uh, something like a massless scalar field, like uh, in, uh, in a Brand's DK theory or uh -huh. not theory based on general relativity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if I'm ever able to take it this way. Uh, when you talk about frames, uh, are you, is, what is that for you? Is that a physical frame or is it a mathematical frame? What, I, what okay, for the, the, the sake of hoping that there's some physical substance to space that a future propulsion can push against, I'm considering them as physical frames and trying to figure out how to ma represent that mathematically so that I can see whether or not these constructs match so some, some of the things that you are discussing, for example, an absolute frame 
that is Euclidean, that, that seems to uh, contradict the experiments that say that general relativity has been... Oh, okay. Well, on that one, um, uh, two things. One, classroom background radiation, which is, in a sense, a absolute reference frame for the mean rest frame of the universe. Okay, and I'm curious to see, I'm wondering in 1920s, had that phenomenon been known then, how that might have affected things. The other part is that even what I'm describing here is talking about and, and trying to figure out how to call these things without, um, what names to put on without being uh, too confusing. The progenitor inertial frame, the one that would be created by the surrounding mass that would then have a um, connection physically to that mass. Well, once you have that, you can have any number of other inertial frames on that that are moving at constant velocity relative to that. And all the special relativistic uh, transformations on that should still hold. Um, now, they don't give you any, those don't give you any way of detecting whether or not there would be an absolute reference frame. Um, and that's why I evoked the, the cosmic background. So, so you evoked the cosmic uh, uh, microwave background as a physical frame, and then the local frame is not a physical frame, it's just a... Uh, well, okay, that's where I'm still playing with it and trying to figure out how to describe that. And... Um, and using analogies first from nested frames, and then if I can get there, then the frame isn't the accelerated with respect to the microwave background. Yeah. It's only moving. So it's, it's, it's linear velocity. So it's not the physical it's frame. It's really the same inertial frame with it, because it's the same velocity. It's just moving with a uniform velocity. You have to accelerate it. <laughs> right. So, so it's an arbitrary frame. Just uh, what? There's nothing special about that local frame. From the point of view of general relativity. Well, what I was trying to figure out, because, in, um, and I'm roughly familiar with the bronze dickey, which tried to put in a scalar thing into the Riemannian geometry part, but if the initial premise of that was created to assume that there was no um, observable absolute frame, then that particular formalism, it would be very difficult to put that back in if its creation assumed a priori that that wasn't the case. So there are, are there other phenomena that you have to look to? And um, which is why I say I'm wondering how things would evolve differently if the cosmic background radiation uh, would be. Now, um, a conjecture in this part is the cosmic background radiation a artifact of a Machian inertial frame as opposed to the expansion universe. I, and, and, just throwing that out as wild thought, but, but so, so the local the, the problem I have with the local frame. The local frame, you agree, is an arbitrary frame. Well, okay. Um, let me make an easy analogy. Um, assuming the universe background inertial frame, if you had a very dense, well, I'm going to keep it easy for spherical shell. Um, locally that was very strong, would the inertia of objects inside that shell be different than if there was no shell? So, so that's outside general relativity because then you have like a, a variation of G uh, with respect to, to uh, position or uh, etc. Yeah, and I've seen some articles that suggest that kind of thing. I have no much idea what sort of validity they have. But if the, the scale of the effects are, if that were true, but if they're so small we don't detect them, that's one thing. If it's if that's being an absolute connection, that's a different thing. And for the, the sake of these mental games, it's like, okay, what if? Um, and I, I don't really know how the answer will turn out or even be able to uh, finish these things, but this is kind of like the thought process of trying to find some other way of attacking the problem. And... Uh, which then brings the you know questions like, okay, is gravitation a side effect of electromagnetic effects or vice versa? And from the propulsion point of view, it would be great if gravitation was a side effect of electromagnetics because we've got a pretty good grasp of affecting electromagnetic things, very controllable. But if it's the other way around, does that 
Is that going to make it a whole lot harder to find some way to uh, discover propulsion effects? Um, yeah, let me go to the next one. Okay. The one thing in trying to compare them, what's nice about electrical charge is you can create cases where it's off, where they cancel, whereas gravitation is always on. The other thing that's different is that um, with electromagnetism, there's insulators and conductors, whereas gravitation, everything's a conductor, there are no insulators. And so for looking for mental games, what if you played with the idea, if there were gravitational insulators, could you do anything with that? And what might be their characteristics be? And if so, how might you look for that? So just kind of the... I don't yeah. understand what you mean by everything's a conductor and gravitation. The gravi uh, gravity. A conductor and electromagnetism stops electrical field lines. Oh, okay. Yeah, a, um, a poor choice of words on my part. Uh, gravity permeates everything. Yeah. Okay. So it's an instant, without, not a conductor. Without resistance, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I did say permeates everything. I didn't say conductor, but I did. Okay. Yeah, I know. Well, that's to, when trying to do these things, and what do you call these things so that you're, uh, you have enough of a name where you can play with it some more, but not a name that you just said something that is a, a mismatch. Um, so... Then the other playful games is, okay, what if you had negative mass? What if you could introduce gravitational bipoles? All these sort of questions. And what I wanted to try and play with those next is the case of, and um, okay, a little bit of segue here. One of the other things I had, was asked to do a few years ago is say, if you had faster than light and gravitational control type of things, how that might affect what you put in a cockpit? And realizing there that if you had these magical devices that could alter gravitational fields or whatever, you would have to have one for the inside of the craft and one for the outside of the craft. The outside of the craft affecting how that craft reacts to the surrounding space, and the inside of the craft is keeping your people in a normal environment so they don't smack against the wall. And that case being kind of an interesting context for thought experiments to say, well, how could you do that? Um, and that's about as far as, okay, yeah, that's about as far as I, I got with things. And so, like I said, you know, this is just, I'm, I'm trying to think of how many different analogies and different ways of looking at things um, that are at least have enough core material that they could eventually be converted into mathematical representations that then you could work through and then see whether or not they compare uh, with actual physical observables, starting from the wishful point of view that the universe behaves in a way that would be useful for space drives, which is a big what if. So that's, that's, that's how I was tackling it. I hope that this at least um, might trigger other ideas or, or whatever, but, uh, or fun to think about, but that's all I got. For now. So, so how, how many uh, how many of these alternatives have been researched? Do you think? None. <laughs> I haven't I haven't done. Um, okay. For example, uh, if I assume mass as the source of gravitational thing, and uh, I assume a scalar, I already get to a point where the scalar potential isn't enough because that doesn't cover the rotation basis. And then for the propagation delay, I was starting to use um, retarded potential type of forms. But I didn't get very far with that. And uh, certainly nothing that had enough rigor to it to where I could continue. So these things are really still kind not of Not just you. Not just you. Everyone. Oh, I, I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and one thing that you and I have talked about before is, um, and this actually may help in some way, is to consider space-time in some way as a fluid, and that there's different phases of the fluid, and there's different interactions of that fluid. Um, that is, it's all the same type of core material, but in just different phases. That will allow the interaction of those different phases via you know, surface tension, for example, viscosity, and a variety of other mm -hmm. things that might be very analogous to some of the concepts you described. Yeah. So, so mostly, this isn't so much to say this is the way things really are. This is more like to say, this is how I play with these things in my head, in case that might be useful for anyone else to know. And 
whether or not I'll finish any of this or whatever, I have no idea. Yeah. So, uh, what are you planning? I understand that the NASA grant may be a two-year grant. A uh, three-year three grant. So, so uh, what, are, what are your plans uh, to do in that grant? Uh, um, okay, with the, the grant is, none of this stuff is a part of the grant. Um, it's comparing uh, interstellar propulsion ideas that already exist, including Starshot, including fusion rockets and, and that. And the placeholder for propulsion physics, I'm doing it simply as an energy conversion, stored energy into kinetic energy and assuming some efficiency factors and also assuming how long would it take if everything goes right before that technology could be at a level where it's useful effects. And with all of those, if, that, if you have this performance now and in the future it might have this performance, and look at all of those from um, the different motivations of doing an interstellar mission. Uh, for example, another motivation, one that affects how important certain technologies are is if you want to stop at the destination. If you just fly by, oh, the beamed energy, yeah, but, uh, and, well, I'm, I was about to use a frame nose brainer, but I'm, I won't. Um, whereas if you want to stop, then you're in a completely different thing. So depending upon what those priorities are, they shift which of those technologies might be basis. So to try and put that in a, um, oh, short segue. Um, Jim Gilland, who works with the Ohio Aerospace Institute, who works with the NASA Glenn, he had done this sort of assessment, a general assessment with Mars missions, um, where you could define the mission in more than one way, you had the various technology options, and did those kind of um, topological maps to see which technology questions were more pivotal about answering the broader thing. So it's to apply that same kind of algorithm rule to the case of interstellar, and where it gets more complicated with the interstellar is predicting the advancement rates over time and finding some way to do that. So it's, it's doing that. Yeah, well, and, yeah I, I really appreciate the, the way you presented this material as it's kind of stuff out of your head and how you thought about things because I think we've all done something similar. But um, the, the way you presented it here was really, really fascinating, very well understood. So I appreciate that okay. for sure. One interesting thing I've always wondered about too is say you have this particular construct where you have an inner shell or an outer shell and whatnot, but, or some sort of space vessel or cockpit, is that you know the, the, whatever mechanism creates these effects has to be protected in some way from their own effects that they're creating. Yeah. Right? That includes power transmission from something going into it and then, you know, you know, how does the exterior outer mold line of the ship not get affected by yeah. the stuff that is being shielded inside? You know, it, it's all different engineering yeah. layers. Oh, well, that's what I find is like when I actually yeah. try and go to a case like that and ask yeah. those questions, yeah. you start to realize things that weren't there. Sure. Um, Keen back to the one mm -hmm. where just playing with, um, you know, if you could separate the active, passive, and inertial, active gravitation, passive gravitation, and inertial masses, could that get you any one? And yeah. then guessing it, running the numbers, and realize, oh, it would only get you something if they were different. Yeah. But I find that at least, you know, playing with these things, you maybe understand better what you don't know next yeah. and would want to study. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, and I guess uh, to put things in the broader context of what I did, when I was running the propulsion physics project, the tactic I was trying to do, because at that time the thing was very con uh, considered lunatic fringish, is how to look at the subject more generally, uh, trying to compare what the ideal goals we wanted to have compared to what physics we already know and what are the unknowns there that are relevant to try and decide, okay, what research could you do that would be at least be relevant to those topics and how would you do that in a organized, credible manner as opposed to what had been done where you'd have a hot topic that would be tested, it wouldn't work, and then the, uh, the topic would be dead for a few years. So I was trying to make it more systematic and a sense I'm trying to apply that now more to, or for the grant, uh, to interstellar in general. So what I've done um, 
more in these areas is trying to define the big picture things rather than to promote any particular device or or theory and so but someone asked well how do you think about these things and well i guess that's another question uh, too um we all have different skill niches and uh, things on this and i'm not sure which of the things that i can do uh, are more unique or not and so if any of you and, and i can't tell because this stuff comes relatively easy for me when i'm not distracted um as well as other stuff, and I don't know if that's the case with other people as well. Also, as well as doing those traceability maps that I had of <laughs> connecting the unsolved problems in physics to what are the critical issues of space drives and faster than light. Um, apparently, that's not that common too. So, any feedback you could give on what maybe are more my unique skills? So I spend time doing that rather than time that other people could do too. I've, Mark, I think it. you're on the right trail with the traceability map. I've told you I use your yeah. 2004 traceability map as a Bible. I ignore what's in the book, um, <laughs> and and I, I have paper copies of a, a color copy that I use to cross off things that are no no longer viable. Um, on this model, this when I saw this, this reminds me of Greg's TriSpace model, but it's really a boundary. You're, instead of a pin layer boundary, you're expanding a transition layer boundary between an inner and outer system. Right, and to give you a place where you can then ask those questions. Yeah. In some systems, forgetting what they are, they have a, a number of nested boundaries that they go through, maybe perhaps seven or eight boundaries. Have you gone beyond just two boundaries? No, because I haven't even figured out how I want to mathematically attack that problem. And if I, you know, with just the two boundaries, if I can figure out what would be a good way to attack that, then I could extend that to multiple boundaries. But in other words, I don't know how I would attack that problem mathematically yet. Also, in the, in the case of waves, especially electromagnetic and gravitic, uh, this is a monopole model. Have you looked at dipole or quadrupole? No. Other than realizing that there are options to explore. Okay. I think with that, can we thank the speaker again? Yeah.